welcome everyone. Good morning. Uh, thank you for uh, being here. Uh, despite the party last night, I heard it was a good one. <laughs> um, so today's panel's titled Whose Digital Future? Engaging Citizens in AI Development and Impact Assessment. I'll be the moderator. My name is Bernakis Skindemir, and I'm a legal advisor at the European Center for Not-for-Profit Law. Uh, ECNL actually works on laws, practices, policies that um, keep civic space and civics freedom uh, alive and well, <laughs> let's say. Um, so in a, in a sense, it's interesting to note that we're not a traditional digital rights organization, and I think that's very telling. It's just that a couple of years ago, we started noticing the impact on the work that we do, um, new ways of, you know, uh, of governments or certain practices that um, shrink the spaces of civil society, grassroots activists, and so our engagement in these topics came as a necessity almost. So that's also why my colleagues always say we never looked for digital rights. It just found us because it became a real big thing. Um, and therefore, when we entered these conversations, we also noticed that we were initially, this was four or five years ago, quite alone <laughs> in the space of you know, hardcore digital rights organizations and, and tech and lawmakers and very specific. And, and that, that this is also why our uh, core part, one core part of our advocacy has always been meaningful participation of a broader uh, group of experts into these discussions. And it is also within this framework that we embarked on this journey of thinking through, so not only advocating in lawmaking, uh, but also thinking through actual tools and practices that could help bring about meaningful engagement. And one of the outcomes of this is our ongoing work on the framework for meaningful engagement in AI uh, human rights impact assessments. Uh, this came about, um, th this was actually a worldwide community effort with 130 plus uh, civil society organizations, experts, academics, uh, but also uh, private sector, uh, talking through what are the real life obstacles, uh, challenges of actually reaching out and engaging. Um, with the intention of also centering the needs of civil society organizations that are at the core that feel the everyday impact. Um, so I guess underpinning these efforts, we have always had these questions, whose digital future are we actually talking about, right? Um, and this is where we are. So we're happy to be here and happy to have this panel. Uh, from uh, different viewpoints and different experiences in the field. Uh, so I think I, I want to uh, introduce my great panelists for today, and I will be taking my notes in front of me. <laughs> so first we have Alina Smith. Uh, she's an advocacy officer at the Platform for International Cooperation on Undocumented Migrants and leads her and leads the work on access to justice, access to health for undocumented people, as well as legal strategies. Thank you so much for being here. Um, next to her, we have Laura Galindo Romero. Uh, she is the AI Policy and Governance Program Manager at Meta, uh, where she leads programs aimed at improving the quality of rulemaking processes in the field of technology uh, and tech policy. Um, on my left, we have Jana Gaidoshova. She's the head of justice and security sector in the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights. Uh, as her background is a human rights lawyer, and her area of specialization includes digitalization of justice and law enforcement, uh, rule of law, and access to justice. Last but not least, maybe some of you have seen him already just the session before, we have Mirko Tobias Schaeffer. He is an associate professor at Utrecht University's research area governing digital society and the Department for Information and Computing Sciences. He's also the co-founder and faculty of science lead at the Utrecht Data School. 
So thanks again all for being here. I actually would like to kickstart the conversation by giving the mic to Alina. Um, could you, from your work and expertise uh, and experiences, um, mostly at PICOM also, maybe first try to set us a stage and give us an understanding of what actually certain impacts could look like when we talk about migrant communities and undocumented people, uh, and maybe from there reflect a bit more on, on what you see is you know, what kind of practices are needed to have actual meaningful engagement in order to really center human needs when developing technologies. Thank you very much, Berna. Um, and thank you for the session. I, I think it's such an important discussion. Uh, whose future, whose technology, um, who gets to decide which technology to address which types of issues and how. Um, and so, you know, maybe much like um, Iknil, PECOM is not a kind of traditional actor in the digital rights space. Um, we're a migrant rights, uh, migrant justice organization. Uh, we're a network organization based here in Brussels with members in 33 countries or so. Um, and we came into this space um, a few years ago um, around the uh, time when the GDPR came into force taking baby steps into this space to understand what the import of that piece of regulation was for our work. Um, and we've been gradually getting deeper and deeper into the work on the intersection of technology and migration. The thing is, once you start looking, um, it, you see that it's everywhere. Um, so the use of technology, including uh, artificial intelligence, permeates. Um, immigration enforcement, and that's really where we see it primarily used. So as a tool to enhance immigration enforcement, so immigration rules. Um, and what are the contexts then? Some examples of the spaces where we see technology, including AI, used in the migration context, you know, maybe most immediately coming to mind is the border, obviously, you know, in terms of the use of drones and the use of surveillance tools um, in the context of land borders, in the context of uh, the Mediterranean, uh, the Aegean Sea, and so on. Um, we also see it in the context of migration procedures. So, you know, people applying for asylum. Um, there is the use of various kinds of tools, um, often to assess credibility um, within a framework, very honestly, of suspicion. There are tools that are used to assess, uh, ostensibly, to assess whether people are telling the truth, um, whether people are you know, uh, being truthful about their country of origin, assessing their dialect, um, uh, often very dubious technology. Um, we see it used um, in the context of policing, for example. We see it in the tools that law enforcement and border authorities are being equipped with to be able to uh, instantaneously identify whether the people they would stop uh, on the street or, or in other contexts has a right to be present on the territory. Obviously transforming those, those interactions which are already, shall we say, fraught very often uh, into immigration enforcement interactions with a whole other scale of potential consequences. So what are our main concerns across this whole array of uses of technology? Um, so you know we're, we're very concerned about criminalization and stigmatization. Again, because a huge impetus for the use of these technologies is the premise of suspicion, the premise of threat, and of identifying threats, of identifying somehow risk, trying to anticipate people's future behavior based on characteristics like their nationality, their ethnicity, if not directly, then indirectly. Um, we see it reinforcing forms of profiling automated profiling in the context of visa applications, in the context of um, policing practice. We know that very often from the fraud's own work that, um, that uh, very often a person's ethnicity, skin color, appearance is used as a proxy for their migration status. So we are essentially uh, emp empowering enforcement authorities to do profiling in this way 
with the purpose of uh, immigration enforcement, among others. And we have deep concerns about accountability. Um, many of these uses are highly hidden. Many of the, the uh, assumptions that the data that underlines these technologies is uh, intransparent, very difficult to understand, and yet is driving decision making that can have enormous impact on people's lives. So what is the value then of consultation? Um, what is the value of talking to people? Um, uh, like Pecom, talking to people um, who themselves uh, are racialized, because it's not only people who are themselves migrants or undocumented who are affected, it's also people who are suspected of such. Um, well, because context matters enormously when we're speaking about impact, um, and we need to think very carefully about what is the reason this technology is coming into being, who is deciding even the issue, the problem that is being addressed, um, and how do we understand impact in that context? And what we too often see in the context of technology used in the migration context, it's that it's immigration enforcement authorities, it's policing authorities, it's security sector um, authorities, it's private sector um, uh, that is essentially driving an agenda without a consideration of impact, um, without a consideration of harm and without a consideration of whether the question is the right one, the problem is the right one at all. So just to end then, um, what, how do we understand participation in this context when there's such disparity in terms of who is legislating, who is developing, who is using, and then who is affected? And I think maybe just three points as a starting point. We need to involve people who are affected early in a process in deciding whatever it is that we intend to use for whatever the purpose is, and not only bring them in at a late stage for their quote unquote input on something that has essentially already been defined. Um, so it, they have to be brought in at an early a stage as possible. The second thing is that participation, meaningful participation, takes time. It takes time. It's not a one meeting, one consultation, one conversation, it's over time. And we need to account for that in our processes. We need to account for the time the process needs to make space for. Um, we need to account for the time we're asking of people to devote to the process. And um, we need to consider their time and availability. Very often we're speaking of people, organizations that are stretched thin and that have other urgent priorities. So we need to take that into account and work around their time and availability, and seriously consider compensation for that time as well, and, and what it is that they can see as outcomes that are important to them. And last but not least, um, a recognition of their expertise. So these are often technical matters, and they may not be technical experts, but they are experts nonetheless in the context where this technology is used, and it, how it already does or can affect them. And that is absolutely a relevant expertise and perspective to bring to these discussions. So they, there is a reciprocity, there is a mutuality, there is an equality in that sense to their engagement. Um, and I think that's a really important uh, kind of starting point in terms of the mindset as well around engagement and participation. So I'll leave it there for now, Brenna. Thank you so much for that. One thing that we also aimed with this framework was also for both the convener um, to um, help them got, take a moment and to think through, OK, who might be really um, affected by this and who do we need to reach out before we start designing, developing early on. So. Uh, all the things that you said on the four points, that's definitely um, uh, also something that came up front when we talked with a broader group of civil society organizations um, joining our efforts in, in developing this tool. So thank you so much for that. Um, this is actually also a nice bridge to the private companies. Um, in this case, Laura from Meta, hi. Uh, although I believe you also have a background in policy making and civil society, right? 
Yes. Um, so my question to you would be um, actually the same from from the perspective of a. Uh, uh, of the private sector, of, of, from your work, um, what do you see? Uh, where do you see the value of engaging stakeholders? But are there also maybe challenges into? Because I can understand that there are maybe like fast production timelines. Uh, so how do you experience that? Um, and and what are your what are your what would you like to share with us on this matter? Thanks. Thank you, thank you so much, Bernat, and then it's a pleasure to share this panel with such distinguished panelists, and I'm very keen to, to learn all about your, your views. Um, and I also had the, the, the honor to participate in the multi-stakeholder uh, project that ECNL is leading, um, and I witnessed really the, the multi-stakeholder views on, on how to think and rethink meaningful stakeholder engagement. Um, so with that background, I also lead an initiative at Meta, is the Open Loop Program. It's a program that aims to build a bridge between policy experimentation, emerging technologies, but also connect that with multi-stakeholder, um, with, with different stakeholders that participate as part of the AI ecosystem, but are broader tech policy ecosystems. And to, to build this, this gap is, is through learning, through collaborative uh, processes, but also to gather evidence on what are the main nuances when we test what we call policy prototypes. Policy prototypes being those that we, we give policies a test drive so that we can provide feedback directly from those that are going to be the addressees of, of those policies, of those frameworks, those that need to operationalize those frameworks. And, um, and, and test in a real environment how this would turn out in practice so that they can provide feedback and, and so on. And we have tested different policy prototypes around the world um, in, in Singapore on AI transparency and explainability, where we learn from companies uh, that participate in this program, for example, how to communicate and engage and, and explain to, to their users, to their customers, about transparency and explainability. Uh, and there we learn, for example, that that different uh, type of um, AI systems, different types of, of solutions, that there's also different types of explainability that that users can um, can reach out to, can understand. Um, and it's not about explaining what the, an AI system does, but also whether the person understood that the AI system does. So there's a lot of learnings at that, let's say, vertical level on one specific vertical of AI, which is AI transparency and explainability. But more interestingly, in India, we are testing how how we can look at stakeholder engagement, meaningful stakeholder engagement, to operationalize AI principles, particularly the principle of human-centered AI, which is a, a principle that is very rich in terms of its human rights impacts, in terms of the impact it also has on the planet. Um, and, and, and through that, we have learned a couple of things through some workshops that we are conducting as part of these testings. So I'm just going to share two, two insights uh, here. The first one is, before meaningful stakeholder engagement. But before engagement, we need to conduct stakeholder mapping. And a stakeholder mapping of what you were saying, the who. Who should be involved? Who should we uh, go to and ask questions? And what we have learned with Indian companies is that sometimes this question is not very straightforward. Uh, when we look at the current frameworks, we look at, um, for instance, the AI life cycle. The AI life cycle, that is, it appears in many different risk management frameworks and tools for accountability. And uh, who do you involve at the plan and design of an AI system? And the language so far proposed by different international frameworks uh, is, is, is not homogeneous. So we talked about, in some frameworks, just to extrapolate to what we have, let's say, as, as current frameworks, we have. Um, just, just to show you a little bit of, of the difference that exists in different frameworks. So for example, uh, Uncitral mentions developer, data provider, deployer, operator, affected person. The Council of Europe is proposing in its draft convention, AI provider, AI user, AI subject. The European Parliament, uh, at the beginning of 2022, added the words end user, AI subject. Uh, in the in the in the Czech Republic uh, presidency, also a small scale provider and product manufacturer, and of course in the EU Act we, we have more that you might be aware of, so provider, user, and user, and so on. So 
the terminology itself is just being developed and, and having a cl some clarity on what could be that taxonomy of AI actors is a thing, uh, one key element to allow for, for better identification of those different types of uh, stakeholders and facilitate uh, companies to, to, to conduct better mapping. So I think that there's some dialogue that needs to happen there in terms of taxonomy of AI actors and proper identification in terms of a stakeholder mapping so that companies can, can conduct better stakeholder mapping when it comes to AI. Um, and so that's one interesting point. And, and maybe the, the last point out of these exercises that, that we have learned as well is in terms of um, stakeholder engagement. What are the tools available for, for how to go about and ask questions? And I think I, I completely echo your words and, and how, how difficult it is to, like, how, what are the, 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 the people that need to be involved, but also how to go about it. And, um, and this is something that we're learning through workshops, through co-design, and that's a, what the program that I lead aims to do, to co-design with different stakeholders, with regulators, with policymakers, with the companies, uh, startups, to see how how they can engage. It's not only about the end user, the customer, which sometimes is seen in terms of user um, user experience research, but also broadly speaking, what a, a impact means for for broader communities. Uh, so I think that the conversation is starting. I think. Uh, companies, societies, and different uh, governments as, are also becoming better, more sophisticated in like the terminology that is used, because those frameworks matter for for guidance, matter for for really translating principles to practice. So, so that's the the the, the ambition and goal to to bring more nuance uh, in such a let's say complex environment, which is the AI ecosystem and all its guidance and regulation. So th thank you for, for that. Yes, sorry. Also very actively taking notes for myself. <laughs> thank you so much, Laura. Um, I would like to give you the mic to you, Jana, from a policy making perspective, also from the role of FRA as a organization, um, monitoring the implementation of fundamental rights impact, but you also you know, with, with, could you tell us um, from your perspective uh, and your work field how uh, meaningful engagement uh, looks and, and maybe also reflect on to what extent certain uh, law instruments such as the UAI Act or other ones uh, could be helpful in this process and in what way? Thanks. Thank you, Berna, and, and good morning. Uh, I am representing the EU Agency for Fundamental Rights, uh, whose main task is to advise EU institutions and member states when it comes to fundamental rights. And we do that by uh, doing uh, applied research. So we are collecting information by going into the member states level, uh, talking to a variety of stakeholders, including those that are directly impacted, and we try to inform that with the, then with the information the relevant uh, EU policymakers, legislators, when they are legislating on a certain issues that have a direct uh, relevance for the fundamental rights, uh, telling them what the reality looks like, what are the challenges uh, in practice, what people see as uh, barriers for them to access their rights. Uh, so we are kind of EU uh, human rights watchdog, if you like. And AI has been with us for several years now, uh, given its uh, direct implication on fundamental rights. We've started looking at first at a very at a very general level at a variety of rights that can be impacted and are impacted by the AI technology beyond data protection and privacy. Uh, then we went on to to focus on certain aspects and specific uh, elements of the AI. We looked into the bias in algorithms that can potentially result in the violation of the right not to be discriminated against, including in the era of predictive policing, for instance. Uh, we are currently concluding research on online content moderation and how these techniques can uh, help with combating hatred online while at the same time protecting freedom of expression. We will be also looking into uh, how practically final rights uh, assessment of the high-risk AI uh, 
can be done, uh, trying to come up with some uh, kind of a guidance. So we are trying to uh, get our hands dirty to understand really the situation and then be able to advise, uh, including in the context of the ongoing discussion on the on the new EU uh, EU AI Act. And uh, what we've seen in our research is uh, that there are very distinct features of the AI environment that one has to bear in mind when discussing what action should be taken, be it when trying to regulate AI, when discussing how meaningfully to engage uh, civil society organization or population at large, uh, and so on. Um, I'll give you an example of, of those features before I go on and give a concrete examples of, of uh, how meaningfully to engage civil society organization beyond just the stakeholder uh, consultation. Uh, uh, the AI, uh, obviously, um, and we've seen that in all the research we've done, uh, the main motivation to use the AI is efficiency and uh, uh, making sure that things go fast, can be run fast, speediness, basically. So not that much quality. And that's not a, I mean, there is no inherent problem in that as such, but one has to be wary of that. Uh, making sure that when we are trying to speed up things and make them more, more efficient, it doesn't come at the cost of a human rights quality, if you like. Uh, second feature, not uh, n any news to you, uh, is that AI is driven by data. Uh, and we've seen over and over in our research, regardless of the field we looked into, that uh, data uh, contains a lot of errors. So, um, I give you an example uh, in our uh, interoperability research uh, where we looked at the EU borders and how certain systems are employed there. We've seen that up to 40% of data that were um, in inputted into the systems were flawed, basically. So, of course, that has a huge uh, human consequences and human rights consequences, and one has to be wary of that. And the third thing, is also a very, uh, very uh, kind of a self-evident in a way. Uh, this technology doesn't stop; it evolves on a daily basis. So when we started working on uh, um, uh, facial recognition technology issues seven, eight years ago, we thought, okay, we conclude research. We have uh, nice guidelines. We can offer that to policymakers, member states, law enforcement to help them to understand the fundamental rights implication when using the te this technology, only to understand that the technology has moved on and we have to start again from with our research. So this never stops, and neither should our uh, discussions and our advice, decisions, and uh, including uh, ways to engage with uh, civil society organizations. So um, moving on, uh, how that can impact and how, what kind of implication that has on ways forward in terms of, uh, of working with the uh, civil society organization and, and people uh, as such. Uh, I would uh, mention three issues. There are more, but maybe three three key uh, issues stemming from our research. One relates to the final rights impact assessment. Uh, the other deals with the the need for an effective oversight, um, and the third one relates to an effective remedy for those who are negatively impacted and want wants to raise a, a complaint. Uh, when it comes to final rights um, impact assessment. Uh, also not a new tool anymore these days. It has been uh, discussed now in relation to EU AI Act, but also the upcoming Council of Europe Framework Con uh, Convention on AI. Um, we see that uh, that can be an effective tool, uh, and we've elaborated on the type of information uh, companies should gather to make sure the fundamental rights input assessment is done uh, effectively. But at the same time, we emphasize the fact that once the information is collected and before the uh, impact assessment is concluded, there needs to be a discussion, engagement with experts, with stakeholders, with civil society organizations to make sure no relevant information was omitted. Also to make sure the diversity, views, uh, diversity of views are taken on board and uh, that indeed uh, nothing important is missed. So this is specifically where also the guide uh, that you spoke about earlier comes very useful because it gives a ways forward in terms of how to do this engagement with, with a civil society uh, effectively. 
Uh, moving on to effective oversight, uh, I'm talking now uh, about the independent, uh, upskilled uh, oversight, well resourced. Uh, we have been referring to the need to use the actors that already exist at the national level, such as national human rights institutions, equality bodies, data protection organizations. All these are uh, natural national human rights watchdogs and uh, have been looking into these issues and should be a starting point. Uh, and these are a natural partners also for civil society organizations uh, who often uh, report or turn to them to make them aware of certain realities. So civil society organization gets to hear uh, about the issues uh, in practice, about the challenges uh, individuals the, do approach uh, civil society organization more often than any other uh, institution. And so it is important there is a kind of a flow of information between these uh, independent bodies and civil society organization. That's a very effective, can be very effective channel to voice uh, concerns of even the most marginalized ones if done effectively and, and, uh, and uh, systematically. Um, and then moving on to the third point, and that's, uh, that will be my last one, uh, effective remedy. Uh, as a right on a paper looks great, very difficult to achieve in practice, especially in the field of AI, which is very complex and where individuals do get lost with complexity, with understanding who to turn to, what to do, and how to do it. Again, uh, important role of a civil society organizations uh, especially those working in the field or those understanding to refer people to relevant organization to help them to make sense of things. Uh, we've seen how uh, effective the strategic litigation can be uh, here in this in this area, which would help not only in the individual case or for for uh, impacted individual and his life, but can bring a change uh, for the population at large. Um, and another tool, there are other tools that in this context can be can be useful. One of them already exists in DSA, uh, and that's the trusted flagger mechanisms. And in our current online content, content moderation project, we've seen that uh, this mechanism can only work when there is a diversity of trusted flagger organizations ensured. Uh, we need to make sure that the legal content is, all the type of illegal content is flagged. Uh, so I think here, uh, importance or, of all the types of civil society organizations to engage uh, uh, would be beneficial to make sure that this system can work and be used to its potential. I will stop here because I believe seven minutes over, but then happy to continue discussion. Thank you. Uh, yes, thanks so much, Anna. And um, I mean, also, in our work, I think we also kind of see the need for effective oversight, but the effective remedy a bit together, because even though strategic litigation and other ways are, are very helpful indeed, there are also a lot of communities that don't have the capacity and the access to go through these lengths. So we are looking forward to how it will work out also on national levels or in light of the AI Act, how, how, uh, what roles maybe for oversight bodies or any other ways of having shorter connections to basically being able to say, hey, I think I'm being impacted, can you check and, and just let them know that they're doing this to make it very simple. Because at the end of the day, sometimes these very existing ways can also be hurdles for certain communities to actually get that effective remedy or act, or even have a place to go to say, I think my rights are being violated. So um, thank you for, for mentioning that. Um, last but not least, again, Mirko. Uh, as academic, you are highly involved in applied research, but also in guiding national or local governments in their processes. Could you tell us a bit more on that while reflecting to the overall question and, and share us your experiences? Thanks. Certainly, thank you. Yes, we come at Utrecht Data School from a little bit of a different angle. Our research is what we call um, 
it, it fits more the description of participatory action research, which means that we really intensively engage with uh, external partners and uh, that our research agenda is very much informed by the urgency and needs that is formulated in the different sectors we investigate and work with. Um, uh, so having that said, we identified four levels where we can actually engage with our external uh, partners or sectors, which would be on the level of policy makers, mostly elected uh, politicians, uh, the level of government employees, those who are the bureaucrats that do the nitty gritty work of public administration, uh, citizen, and the broader general public. Uh, we haven't really developed any uh, methods and tools for addressing the general public other than uh, trainings, education, uh, occasional speaking, and uh, what what in, in most academic activities is summarized under public engagement and which we find uh, really less effective than the work of actually going um, to work together in a cooperative projects with external partners. We did that mostly on the level of bureaucrats, government employees on local, provincial, and national level in the Netherlands. Uh, we have a beautiful flyer in the conference back, and there see, you see on the back side, you see one of the instruments that we've developed for actually facilitating this kind of multi-stakeholder conversations. Uh, the data ethics decision aid was actually born not out of our own uh, ideation, but actually brought to us. Uh, the need was formulated by the bureaucrats we worked with. That was uh, around 2016, 17, when bureaucrats approached us and said, we do a lot of work with data, but actually what we do is political labor. We do not have a mandate for it because we are not elected. We are... Uh, service um, uh, bureaucrats and we need to we need to do something to make values that are carried in these data projects explicit we need to make explicit who's actually affected and uh, so um, Going from there, so ethics found us in a way because we were trained uh, media scholars or came from critical data studies and others. We started to develop this process that actually brings together a number of stakeholders, not necessarily end users or citizens. Uh, I will tell an anecdote about that in a minute, but generally people who are affected or are proxies of those who are affected. So if it would be an algorithm about poverty detection, it would be very relevant to have someone on the table who works in the social domain of a municipality or who is uh, um, affiliated with organizations tackling poverty issues in said community uh, to bring in their, their street-level bureaucrat insight, in, in a way, you might say. Uh, what we found really handy in this uh, data ethics decision aid is that it structures a conversation that makes values explicit that are carried by a data or AI project. Those values would go unseen if not made explicit in such a situation. And the open questions that we ask during these assessments help to identify possible collateral damage, problems you do not think of, um, uh, things that might happen downstream when uh, a, a system is deployed, thinking about uh, the administration and organizational responsibilities of deploying such a, uh, a project and so forth. So DIDA and the Data Ethics Decision Aid really has been used widely in a bottom-up approach by Dutch uh, uh, government employees on a local level and um, uh, the levels on, on, uh, on provinces. However, we were always asked, where are the data subjects? Which is a fair question, because in our assessment, it was, uh, it's a three-hour assessment. You have people at the table who are very well-informed, very well-learned uh, experts in their respective areas. And citizens were only present as proxies. And I know, of course, as it is a mantra in value-sensitive design, that they say nothing about us without us. And, um, but we also had, a, and now comes the anecdote, we had uh, the moment where we should uh, consult a municipality on installing a geofence in the city center just for solving a mobility issue. So that was already a, quite a crazy idea. Why would you collect uh, mobile cell phone data when you want to, to solve a mobility issue? And the project manager who was tasked with solving the mobility problem uh, found two citizens that were set as proxies on the table and said, yeah, we have the citizens of that area here. 
And there was no question about, are these representative? Who do they represent? Uh, and so forth. So it was quickly, uh, after a quick uh, view on the project, was clear that the pro project was illegal, as there was a house of worship within the geofence, and you could identify from the data points uh, uh, what community would go there to pray at which times. Um, that aside, uh, in Dutch government nowadays, public participation or par uh, citizen participation is really uh, a policy impetus. It is everywhere. So we just finished a research together with the province of Utrecht where they looked into um, data collection by citizens. And we found some really interesting things there. Firstly, questioning the motivation. So what is the motivation to participate in these projects? One of the projects just wanted to have volunteers to place a sensor on their windows. But they thought they had to build a community around it just for placing the sensor. But you can't place the sensor without being part of a community. Maybe you're not interested in that. And there was no wider picture. Is the motivation just to have a sensor and get some little information how many trucks pass your window every day? Or do we want to participate in a data-savvy community of citizens that actually puts forward questions about environmental uh, aspects, uh, life quality, um, uh, cultural offerings in the city, and so forth? Everything that you could datafy, whatever it is, whether you have the measurements in place already or whether they need to be developed. We have great success stories in the Netherlands, like citizens living around airport Schiphol, who started to measure the noise uh, levels there on their own, defeating the public administration who wanted to push for an extension of the airport. Could, they could, based on this data quality, the data collection, they could argue this is not acceptable for our life situation. So this brings me to the second part, the capacity. What capacity do you have as citizens to actually meaningfully engage? Everything else would be tokenism. If you just have a fake citizen sitting at a table to to say something, that's not citizen participation. What is the mandate, the agency, to you actually assign as a government, as an authority, or as a platform, as a commercial platform, to your users or your citizens? Do they have a say? I just think of the early days of Facebook when they had these fake elections on Facebook that were totally meaningless, but was, were called an instrument of governance. Um, so the last part is actually not only having given the people the tools, the infrastructures, the capacity to, to change something, but also the mandate, the agency to implement it. Uh, that would uh, uh, be um, uh, citizen participation. Last word, as a scholar and a citizen, and uh, also because we have someone from the platform here, and uh, as a researcher who works with data, uh, I think access, access to information, access to training data, access to to impact assessments is vital for, uh, for um, informing a fourth estate, an emerging tech journalism that can in inspect um, uh, models, impact assessments, training data, and so forth, and provide the very much needed information for the electorate to drive the deliberative mm -hmm debates that are going on in society and in the elected gremia we have, city council, uh, parliaments, uh, supranational bodies like the European Parliament. So the access is vital, and I say that also because of this ongoing farce with Twitter at the moment, uh, where you once have access, then not, and then you should delete your data set and so forth. And uh, I apologize saying that, but Facebook has always been a problem with accessing the data as a researcher. So I think that it is really relevant that there are bodies in our society Force state, journalists, researchers, advocacy organizations that have the mandate by law to get this information and these insights. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mirko. Um, <clears throat> I noticed that I have many questions myself, but um, before giving the floor also to you for questions, if you do have the intention, there is a mic there in the middle, you can stand behind. It, I guess. And while you think about a question you might have, I did want to give just a little opportunity to my panelists to see if you might want to respond to anything you've heard from your co-panelist or you have a follow-up question. This is the moment. <laughs> Please go ahead. Maybe very briefly on Mirko's last point, uh, which I very much uh, agree with. Uh, 
issue of, of research and being able to access data for the research purposes, I think it uh, goes along with, uh, as a, it's an important safeguard together with, if you talk about impact assessments or any other oversight, I think being able to do uh, research on this issue is, is, a, is a key. I mean, that moves on, that helps us for the transparency reasons, for a trust of people, what's going on. I think it's it's a, a very important also to de decide on the changes, possible changes for the for the rules. We have to really understand what's going on, and it's uh, and it's difficult if uh, you don't have access or you have a variety of access depending on a, on a platform. So, uh, I mean, I don't know. Maybe if you want to react to that, how you see it from your perspective, uh, because we've also encountered these issues. When we were trying to do research, uh, often we had to uh, do it indirectly because the access was not possible. So we just created the data set and we work with that. So thank you. Thank you. Just, just very briefly and with the big caveat that this is the area of expertise of my other colleagues. Um, I just focus on, on the open the program and working externally with, with, the, with a consortium of, 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 of stakeholders. Um, I I don't have much to say just because of my area of expertise, um, but I'm happy to connect you with the different teams. I'm, I know that of course it, this is a priority for, for for the company analyzing analyzing these issues and and working together with the the, the relevant stakeholders in the context of of um, of access to 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 researchers, but also in terms of. Uh, discussing uh, in terms of accountability, right? Like access, and, and maybe uh, th maybe this is an, uh, a conversation yesterday in another panel, dismissifying access to the algorithm. Um, and it caught my attention because there are many aspects to think about that sometimes like asking for access to an algorithm, there's not such thing as a, the algorithm, but like uh, it has to, there has to be much more nuance in, in this, because at this, what, what's at stake in, in this conversation is accountability. And, uh, and I think that there's so much work need, that needs to be done to bring some nuance on what does it mean, a, a, the, the questions that arise in, in these in this interactions. So actually, I, I would like to bring the, the question back and in, in terms of like, what, what are those gaps that need to be addressed uh, in terms of access but in terms of also the other challenges that, that remain uh, for, for, for this type of access and like bringing the perspective of, of those involved in, in this, in these, um, in this interaction. So uh, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't answer the question directly, but I, I promise I'll connect you with my colleagues and, and bring more insights to that. That's a very quick response because I, I don't want to linger on that particular aspect as there are so much more um, uh, points to discuss uh, about uh, whose digital future it is. But in general, I would say we just need uh, not a bilateral agreements between platforms and individual, individual research groups or universities, but we need a fundamental um, solution where research access is given as a, uh, as a default um, especially if a platform has a public quality. So if it is something that resembles public space and affects our, our public uh, life, it should be natural that we can investigate it as a society, especially as these platforms are bigger than the companies driving them. Uh, the companies themselves have a hard time understanding what's actually happening on their platforms, especially as they're limited already in their language they provide this for so many more languages than they're able to speak themselves. So they are quite um, limited to the inside of the social impact of their own platforms in most areas of the world, actually. If there's still time, just for coming back quickly to the point on accountability, and I thought some really helpful points were raised um, by Jana and Mirko. Um, and you know maybe we'll come back a little bit later to the AI Act, but I think one important piece about that legislation is precisely the recognition that accountability, like that you can actually just say no to certain uses, like bans. Sometimes the risk is too great and oversight is too inadequate. Um, and um, <clears throat> there are too many obstacles to accountability. So we need to have 
some types of uses that are just impermissible. And then we need to have safeguards, very specific ones around um, those that are identified as high risk. Um, and just on your point, I think, Berna, about you know, accessing mechanisms of, of redress or strategic litigation, um, I think you know, one thing civil society has really been pushing for is accountability through opportunities for redress, but also you know, through, for example, um, like civil society representation. So not only as individuals, because there are significant limitations to individuals' ability, um, but there are, there are ways in which civil society organizations can take up an issue that maybe also has a wider impact beyond just an individual. Um, so just quickly on that point. Thanks so much. Um, yes, if there is a question, you can uh, go there. Thanks. I wanted to open up. I, I did want to say another thing, but I also got a red uh, point saying, that we should start wrapping up. So questions first. Please go ahead, Merve. And if you can introduce yourself and your question, that would be great. Absolutely. Merve Hickok, uh, president for Center for AI and Digital Policy. Uh, my question is to Elena, uh, and I'm going to bring it back from another panel that she was in on Monday. And there was a question about data rights of migrants and refugee and asylum seekers, whether they could uh, access you know, whether they had data rights, whether they could apply, and the reply from the commission representative was civil society should help them. Uh, they do have rights, uh, but they just don't know about it, and civil society should help them. Setting aside the reality of the uh, and the power imbalances, um, <coughs> one is that a actually helpful conversation. Second, EU AI Act leaves out uh, transparency, uh, obligations from law enforcement and uh, mi migration enforcement uh, bodies. So you don't even know what, sub what systems that you're subject to to ensure your rights, to know your rights for EU AI Act, GDPR. You just don't know what you're being subjected to. So what would be your idea, to Elena, to what would be your ideal situation where civil society is not asked to take so much uh, on uh, for what should be a human right. And the second question is I almost want to challenge the uh, title of the session as well. It says engaging citizens. <laughs> should it be engaging uh, humans? Is it only citizens that we care about? And there might, there might be just like one, a more focused conversation for this panel, but I'm wondering if that was the intention. Let me just first of all say I completely agree. <laughs> and this again shows that not just civil society or organized civil society itself, we also have work to do on ourselves. We also don't know every type of impact uh, on communities that technology can have and therefore I think reinforces this notion that we, not only civil society, but also other actors need to get in there they, and not wait for them to come, but also actually do the outreach and the work in understanding these contexts from, from their experiences. So thank you for pointing that out, Merve. Thank you. Those are such important and big questions, and I know our time is short. Um, so maybe I'll just uh, say very briefly that, um, so we do see an important opportunity with AI Act, as I mentioned, with what we can still push for. The, the legislative process is on, ongoing, and it will be increasingly challenging, but what we can still push for in terms of bans, things that are just red lines. We have some important ones in there related to policing, related to emotional recognition, lie detection, these types of things, including in the border context where they'd be applicable. But we can push, we're trying to push for more migration-specific bans, and we are pushing for mechanisms around transparency, the registration of uses by public authorities for things that are high risk, fundamental rights impact assessments, and also for measures around remedies. So there's an ongoing work there. There's always the reality of what people can get in practice. And it's, it's deeply concerning what accountability would look like um, in reality, even in the best case scenario of what we could get from the act. And I think what my colleague said yesterday or two days ago is what I'll just say today. There's a bigger piece about justice and migration 
And that's really where so much of this work has to be. What a lot of this technology is doing is making things worse. But the fundamental inequities and harms come from an overall agenda that is really problematic. And that's, I think, where we need to focus our energies also collectively. Thank you, because one of the things that I always keep saying, even if we just talk about the technology, even if you, if you have the cleanest data, but if that technology is being used to uh, give results to a overall policy that in itself is not okay, then it doesn't matter how good or pure or well designed your technology is. And, and that in itself, again, I think is proof that, you know, Technology as such should be seen as an instrument rather than just the thing on its own, I suppose. So thank you, thank you for the question and thank you for addressing these. Uh, is there anyone else that would like to? Uh, please feel free to go. I saw four more hands up and I think that would be the cap. Uh, <laughs> looking at my stage manager, hi. <laughs> um, so one, two, three, and you're also if there's time for it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, Anna Masgal from Wikimedia Europe. I have a question to Laura. Um, I'm very interested in those uh, policy experimentations. And I'm wondering whether this is um, kind of for uh, Meta's um, internal understanding uh, of how those policies work or, or could work. Or is it in any meaningful way communicated to the public? And if it doesn't happen, then whether there is a plan to include those um, deliberations, at least on those policies that actually do come into place, into any sort of um, risk assessment and impact assessment, either under DSA or the uh, future AI Act. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for that question. And just very briefly, uh, this uh, is at the core of the program to make all these insights available to everyone. So we publish all these results and insights uh, under common license. So you can find all the reports related to, to each of the, of the testings that we conduct at uh, www.openloop.org. So you can find that and have access. And the idea is that we all learn by doing. So thank you so much for that question. Hi, my name is Anne Mollen. I'm from Algorithm Watch, but I'm also a researcher at the University of Münster. Um, we have been doing work on worker participation along the machine learning um, pipeline, and our experience has been you need, aside from the content question, you need established structures, organizational structures to establish participation. In a work context, it is or like in like in some context, it is there. So I could ex ex I think it's a challenge uh, in less organized contexts. So um, I was just wondering, maybe it's a question for Mirko, but maybe also for other people. Um, do we need to establish these structures in able to enable participation? Thank you. A very quick response. So uh, we at the data school were, were, were wondering about that as well. We found that our data ethics decision aid with professionals and proxies of um, uh, affected communities worked very well in, in getting the job done in a relatively short time. Uh, at the moment, there's the Ministry of the Interior in the Netherlands busy with developing the idea of so-called data dialogues, something that resembles more the citizen councils that we see emerging more frequently now across Europe, where uh, a representative and a randomly selected group of citizens that discusses a certain topic and comes to a sort of a deliberative um, uh, deliberation process. Uh, this is something that is ongoing. And I'm involved in the talks. I don't know what will come of it. But maybe this is really interesting to have larger problems, like general questions around um, fundamental uh, uh, questions about do we want surveillance technology? Uh, to what extent do we want that? And so forth, to, to de debate that in, in, in such, a, such a forum. But as I said, I don't know where we are going with this. This is ongoing. Is there anyone else that wanted to respond to that question? 
maybe just very briefly, and if you want to, one area that we explore at Open Loop, in addition to the programs, is also the potential for experimental governance tools for policymakers. And, and what you mentioned, a kind of these data dialogue, citizen councils, mini publics, is one of the many different structures and tools that policymakers can look at when governing emerging tech. There's not one size fit all, but in the in the catalog of tools for experimental governance, there are very interesting examples around the world and, and how, how to tackle these complex questions. So just to invite you to learn more about experimental governance tools. Thank you. Hi, I'm Connor, Connor Dunlop. Uh, I'm from the Ada Lovelace Institute. Um, I wanted to ask a question um, basically about a couple of mechanisms that uh, Jana and Mirko, you mentioned um, from the DSA, so the trusted flagger and also the vetted researcher access. Um, I wanted to basically get your opinion on how well you think these could map onto the AI Act as well, especially in, when you look at something like a foundation model, like what Meta builds. Like to me, um, I've heard actually a lot of uh, AI labs like Google, DeepMind recently saying that there should be researcher access, independent audits. So to me, it would make sense for the AI Act to have uh, something similar. So I wanted to get your opinion on, on how well that would map on. And maybe also with trusted flaggers, um, I think also with like a foundation model, um, potentially uh, if there's API access um, and something is going wrong, there, could, there maybe could be a way that they could flag to the provider to take corrective action. Um, so yeah, any thoughts you have on that? I'd love to hear them, thanks. Maybe I can start and then Mir Mirko can come in as well. Uh, what you're raising is uh, is very important from so many uh, for so many reasons. One of them is uh, from the legal perspective, it's such important that the different pieces of legislation speak to each other, and we understand their relationship. And I think we see that more often than not that with the EU laws, uh, that's often not the case. So um, indeed, uh, I mean, uh, that's something that uh, should be uh, and hopefully might be still caught and, and be addressed in the discussions. Uh, but um, it is something that is important also from, from the pr principle of legal clarity and, and uh, foreseeability. So uh, by all means, uh, using already, uh, using the tools that already work or are already put in place, building on the experience and using them, applying them in other fields is a way to go, um, always has been. So uh, I would hope that, yes, uh, we could go, they, that, go that direction and uh, uh, hopefully in the discussions uh, uh, from your side, from, from the experts side, from the civil society organization side, from our side, uh, we can keep raising these issues uh, to make sure that this can be picked upon. But I fully agree, and I think that should be a matter of, cor of course, actually. Yeah, the, the only thing I have to add is that uh, from, a, from a research perspective, I think that universities have done so far, uh, and then I don't mean individual universities, they are included in that, but academia at large has done a really poor job in developing the necessary legal weight to fight for our fundamental right to do research. Uh, we encounter that regularly when we are bullied by uh, large companies uh, because of our data practices, uh, when we are denied access, or when we are uh, confronted with um, really unreasonable uh, fees that, that are uh, needed. Um, apart from that, I think that an emerging market for auditors that can come in and audit processes would be really something that would be beneficial. Okay, thank you. Uh, please go ahead. Um, thank you. I'm uh, Charles Robb from the University of Edinburgh and the Alan Turing Institute. I'm particularly interested in um, the sector of law enforcement and border control and so on. And I wonder whether those of you on the panel who have had experience with citizens' participation um, have had uh, police representatives, uh, police persons, or border control people as part of the um, stakeholder consultations, or uh, what has been your experience with that? Do they regard it as potentially very confrontational, and what do the other stakeholders who are around the table think uh, about their presence 
uh, in those uh, sessions. Thank you. I can't, we haven't done anything similar in the context of technology or AI. Um, but I think, um, you know, in the past, we have, for example, worked with law enforcement officials around some of our work uh, regarding access to justice questions. Um, and um, we have engaged with them in different ways. Some of our members also do work with law enforcement actors at the national level. And we have found that typically they are self-selected. So they are individuals who already have some sense of investment or interest in engagement around these issues. What we have seen in our work in the Secretariat is that it, it very often ends there. So it, it's a few who engage, but structurally there's no commitment. Um, institutionally there's no commitment or investment. And so we have been querying really um, the, the helpfulness. Um, so it, it can, I think, have some benefits to have uh, these interactions, but when you're speaking about structural violence, structural problems, we haven't seen that type of engagement um, from these partners. And so ultimately, I think at the end of the day, the impact in terms of investment of resources and time of civil society is very, very limited. Um, because we're speaking to a small proportion of individuals who already are open um, and who very often don't have power to actually affect change within their institution. So I think we see the benefit actually, and, and the truth is that very often in these spaces, they are the ones like institutionally, um, <clears throat> their, or, their organizations, those actors, border, border agencies at the EU level, Frontex, Europol, are the big voice. Uh, the decisive voice on investments in these types of technology. So they are overrepresented already. Um, and so we're investing more energy in kind of the broader engagement on these issues from those who, who essentially have been sidelined. So I, that's a long way of answering you. Um, but I think we've seen that there are, it's, there are significant limitations, even where individuals have been receptive or helpful. Um, there are, it's an investment of resources into individuals who ultimately, there are profound limitations to enacting structural change. So, yeah. Uh, I, just, I just want to point seconds. to the excellent work of Sarah Wine, who uh, has done extensive research on the LIPD and their use of Palantir and uh, monitoring citizens. So that might be a way to go. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, of course, to my panelists for coming here and sharing this. Um, I also want to thank you all. You were a great audience. And thank you for all the great questions. Uh, if I mean, just as a last note, the framework for meaningful engagement is actually an ongoing document. It's never really finished. So if you feel inspired by today's session and you want to leave some comments on it, please go to ECNL. Dot org, or you'll ha you must have had a pamphlet in your goodie bag that has a QR code that brings you right there, because we're always open to, to more input and keep developing the framework. So once again, all of you, thank you very much, and please enjoy the last day of the conference. Thank you.